Hello, everyone. <laughs> Thanks for joining us today. Uh, so this is our uh, second concert that we're putting together, and uh, I have a few notes here. So a little bit of info before we get started playing. So welcome today to today's concert featuring the classic jazz band. This is our second show celebrating the life and legacy of jazz icon Maddie Matlock. Matlock was an American jazz clarinetist and band leader who made a lasting impact on mid-20th century jazz. Born on December 27, 1907 in Paducah, Kentucky. Matt, oh, we have people from Kentucky here? All right, thanks for joining us. Uh, he began his musical career in the late 1920s, playing with renowned bands and orchestras like the New Orleans Rhythm Kings. From 1929 to 34, Matlock replaced Benny Goodman in the Ben Pollock Band doing arrangements and performing on clarinet. He joined Bob Crosby's band in 1935 as clarinetist, playing with both the main Crosby band and the smaller Bobcats group. After his time with Crosby, Matlock became a sought-after studio musician in Hollywood, collaborating with legendary artists like Frank Sinatra, Bing Crosby, and Louis Armstrong and Ella Fitzgerald. He also formed his own band in the 1950s. Our program today features the music from his second and third albums from Warner Brothers Records, which beautifully capture the essence of Matt Lock's, Matt Lock's music. So as I mentioned in our last concert, I recently acquired the, uh, the music from Bill Allred's library. And today, we actually have Bill Allred in the audience, I believe. Bill, are you, are you in here, Bill? There he is, he's in the back. And Bill was kind enough to come back. Yeah, that's Bill Allred. Let's hear it for him. And prior to the show, Bill was kind enough to come into the dressing room and meet all the guys and tell us some stories. So we all really enjoyed that. <laughs> so anyway, uh, this music is very challenging to play. And uh, uh, we, we put in a lot of time and effort so that we can deliver this in a respectful manner. Be, you know, that Bill's, Bill Allred's classic jazz band mesmerized audiences with their mastery in, of traditional jazz. They skillfully revived timeless tunes with a nod to the golden age of swing, showcasing impeccable musicianship, tight ensemble playing, and a healthy dose of energy. By delving into Bill's library, we hope to honor his legacy while adding our own unique touch to these cherished arrangements. So let's start the program out today. We're going to... Uh, do music from the uh, two albums that Maddie did. The first one is called They Made It Twice As Nice As Paradise, and they called it Dixieland. Yeah, quite a title. <laughs> it might be the longest title ever. Uh, so anyway, uh, th this is from the uh, uh, liner notes uh, from, from that recording. They made it twice as nice as Paradise, and they called it Dixieland, is more than just the longest album title in history. It's a credo, an attitude, an explanation, a way of life. It's what Maddie Matlock and his Paducah Patrol like to do and do so well. Maddie's first album for Warner Brothers was The Big Dixieland Story, a definitive musical picture of Dixieland music at the time and place of its origins, New Orleans, just after World War I comes now a second album, a legitimate sequel, which carries Dixieland through the 20s and 30s, during which time it spread around the country, assimilating all kinds of music and pleasing all kinds of people. In the ever-widening field of jazz, certainly no style has shown more vitality and persistence than Dixieland. As long as there is a Maddie Matlock and a Paducah Patrol to keep playing, Dixieland will continue to be twice as nice as Paradise. That's from the album. So we're going to play that opening track, Twice as Nice as Paradise. Uh, it's a Richard Whiting composition from 1916. It was originally written to salute Ireland, not Dixieland. It started off in Tin Pan Alley and wound up being played by jazz musicians. Richard Whiting was an American composer and songwriter best known for his contributions to the great American songbook. He was born in 1891 in Peoria, Illinois, and he passed away in 1938 in Beverly Hills quite a journey. Whiting came from a family with strong musical background. His father, Richard, was a successful composer and music publisher, and his mother, Emma White, was a popular vaudeville singer. 
this musical environment likely played a significant role in, in shaping his early interest in music. Some of his most famous compositions include Hooray for Hollywood, Ain't We Got Fun, She's Funny That Way, and many others. So we're going to open the show, and I'm going to try to do a whole lot less talking. This is, they made it twice as nice as Paradise, and they called it Dixieland. Thank you so much. That was Mr. Jeremy Fratti on the clarinet and Derek Harris on the trombone. Next up is a tune from 1929 composed by George Rubens alongside legendary jazz figures Jack Teagarden, Eddie Condon, and Peck Kelly. Uh, Peck Kelly was a piano player uh, who was playing this tune around Houston when Jack Teagarden heard it. And uh, he took the tune back with him to, to New York and kind of made it popular. Uh, this has been recorded by many, many people, but uh, some of the people that have recorded is Eddie Condon, Pete Fountain, and Eddie Miller, who added their own unique interpretations to timeless compositions. Uh, a special note, Eddie Miller's exceptional Barry Sachs talents are showcased on the album, so he had a great recording of his own on this tune. Uh, Stan Reitzman was featured on the piano on this recording, and today we're going to feature Mr. Bob Thornton on I'm Going to Stop Mr. Henry Lee. Stomp, not stop. Thank you. 
That's Mr. Bob Thornton on the piano. That's a Pliny is a jazz standard with music composed by Lou Pollock and lyrics written by Ray Gilbert. The song was first published in 1914, making it one of the earliest jazz compositions. Since its inception, it has become a popular tune recorded and performed by numerous jazz bands and musicians over the years, typically as an instrumental. The composition started as a rag, but quickly became a favorite in the traditional jazz and Dixieland repertoire. It, is, it has remained a standard in those genres ever since. This song's popularity was further cemented in the 1920s when it became a hit recording for various bands. One of the earliest and most famous renditions was by the New Orleans Rhythm Kings in 1923. Subsequent versions by other notable bands such as uh, Bing Crosby and the Benny Goodman Orchestra also contributed to its widespread recognition. The comedian Jackie Gleason also used it in his television shows in the 50s and 60s. And for those of us who have played with the Tommy Dorsey Orchestra, this tune is almost always in the program. And tonight, or today, we actually have the leader of the Tommy Dorsey Orchestra sitting right in the front row. That's Mr. Terry Myers. Let's hear it for him. <laughs> this is That's a Plenty. That's Phil Lorenz on the Barry Sax. Once again for Jeremy Fratti on the clarinet. Derek Harris had that last trombone break. Let's hear it for him.
I'm Coming Virginia is a jazz standard with music by Donald Haywood and lyrics by Will Marion Cook. The song was first published in 1926 and has since become a classic in the jazz repertoire. It has been recorded and performed by numerous jazz musicians over the years. Ethel Waters first recorded it for Columbia Records on September 18, 1926, and first sang it during her Broadway premiere in a production of Africana at Daly's 63rd Street Theater in 1927. After the Waters release, the tune was adapted by numerous Dixieland groups who increased the tempo. Cornetist Bix Beiderbeck recorded the song in 1927 with Frankie Trumbauer, and it was sub subsequently widely recorded in the late 1920s and 30s by artists such as Fats Waller, Bing Crosby, with the Paulman White Orchestra, uh, Paul Whiteman Orchestra, <laughs> easy for you to say, on April 29th, 1927, uh, in one of Crosby's earliest recordings, Django Reinhardt, Artie Shaw, Art Tatum, Maxine Sullivan, Sidney Bechet, Louis Armstrong, Teddy Wilson, and in 1938, Benny Goodman featured it in his Carnegie Hall concert. Here's Maddie's arrangement of I'm Coming, Virginia.
once again for Jeremy Fratti on the clarinet. That's Sean Villanueva on the trumpet. And Alex Kastner on the other trumpet. Who's Sorry Now is a popular song with music written by Ted Snyder and lyrics by Bert Kalmer and Harry Ruby. It was originally published in 1923 and has since become a well-known and enduring standard in the American popular music repertoire. The song's lyrics express the theme of regret and heartbreak after a relationship has ended. The singer addresses their former partner asking, who's sorry now? The song's emotional and relatable content struck a chord with audiences, contributing to its widespread popularity. Who's Sorry Now gained significant attention and commercial success when Isham Jones had a major hit with it in 1923. However, the song truly became an enduring classic after being recorded by Connie Francis in 1958. Francis's version was uh, a more upbeat and energetic arrangement, blending elements of traditional pop and rock and roll. Her recording became a massive commercial success, reaching the top of the charts and becoming one of Connie Francis' signature songs. The success of her recording revitalized interest in the song, leading to covers by vari various artists like Ella Fitzgerald, Bobby Darin, and Brenda Lee, and of course, Maddie's 1958 recording. So we'd like to play this for you now. Uh, this will feature uh, Mr. Corey Paul on the trombone. This is called Who's Sorry Now? That's Corey Paul on the trombone. Jeremy Fratti on the clarinet once again. You Can Depend on Me is a popular jazz standard with music by Charles Carpenter and lyrics by Louis Dunlap and Earl Father Hines. The song was first published in 1931 and has since become a classic in the jazz and vocal repertoire. The song's lyrics convey a message of uh, trust, loyalty, and unwavering support between two people. 
The singer reassures their loved one that they can always rely on them, no matter the circumstances. This theme of steadfast commitment and devotion resonated with audiences contributing to the song's enduring appeal. You Can Depend On Me has been recorded and performed by numerous jazz and popular artists over the years. One of the earliest notable versions was by Louis Armstrong, who recorded the song in 1931, shortly after its publication. Armstrong's soulful and em emotive interpretation further popularized the song. Over the decades, the song has been covered by various vocalists and instrumentalists like Lester Young, Billie Holiday, Count Basie, Nat King Cole, and Tony Bennett, among others. And of course, Brenda Lee had a top 10 hit with it in 1961. So we'd like to play for you now, You Can Depend On Me. That featured our two trumpet players, Alex Kastner and Sean Villanova. And of course, once again, Jeremy Fratti. I think he's featured on every tune. <laughs> Three Little Words is a popular song with music by Harry Ruby and lyrics by Bert Kalmar, two of the composers that wrote Who's Sorry, Who's Sorry Now. It was written in 1930 and has become a well-known and enduring standard. The song's lyrics are simple yet charming, conveying the magic of love and the joy of being in a romantic relationship. The three little words in this title refer to, I don't know, get away from me. Get, no, that's four. <laughs> I hate you. No, of course, it's I love you. The song gained popularity when it was featured in the 1930 musical film Check and Double Check, starring Amos and Andy. The song was introduced by Bing Crosby and was a commercial su success, reaching the top of the charts at the time. 
Since its introduction in the 1930s, Three Little Words has been covered and recorded by numerous artists with bar from various genres, including Duke Ellington, Nat King Cole, Ella Fitzgerald, and Frank Sinatra. Uh, in the mid-70s, the Advertising Council used a fully orchestrated instrumental version of the song in a series of PSAs about seatbelt safety. The tagline of these spots was, seatbelts, it's a nice way to say I love you. Anybody remember that? I don't either. <laughs> This is three little words. Once again, Jeremy Fratti on the clarinet. That's Corey Paul on the trombone. Lazy River is a popular jazz song with music written by Sidney Aridin, with lyrics added later by Hoagie Carmichael. Aridin was a jazz clarinetist and songwriter from New Orleans. It was uh, first recorded in 1931 by Hoagie Carmichael himself and has since become a jazz standard. The song's relaxed and mellow melody, along with its evocative lyrics, create an image of peaceful, winding river where one can escape the hustle and bustle of everyday life. The lazy river metaphor is often used to symbolize tranquility and the desire to let go of worries and cares. Hoagie Carmichael's original recording featured his smooth and laid-back vocal style, accompanied by his own piano playing. The song gained popularity in the early 30s, but it wasn't until later that it became a widely recognizable and covered standard in the jazz and popular repertoire. One of the most famous early renditions of Lazy River was by Louis Armstrong and his orchestra in 1931. Armstrong's iconic trumpet playing and soulful vocals added a new dimension to the song and helped propel it into further fame. Over the years, it has been recorded by numerous jazz and swing and traditional pop artists like Bing Crosby, Benny Goodman, Bobby Darin, and of course, Michael Buble more recently. So we'd like to play for you now, Lazy River.
That's Mr. Jake Jones on the guitar. Let's hear it for him. Jeremy Fratti on the clarinet. And how about that Barry Sax playing of Phil Lorenz? Okay, we've got one more tune for this set, and we'll take a short intermission after this. The song, Song of the Wanderer, was composed by Neil Moret. Neil Moret was a pseudonym for Charles N. Dam Daniels, an American composer and songwriter. Uh, the tune was published in 1918 and became a popular song during that era. It is a sentimental and romantic ballad that tells the story of a wandering soul seeking love and connection. The song's lyrics evoke feelings of longing and desire for companionship. Over the years, uh, the song has been recorded by various artists like Kid Ory, Count Basie, Billy Eckstein, and the country swing group Asleep at the Wheel. So this is not a ballad version. It's an up-tempo, and this uh, is the last track of that first or second recording that Maddie did. So we're going to close the set with Song of the Wanderer. Let's hear it for our dueling trombone players, Corey and Derek. And how about it for the whole band? Stand up, everyone. Thank you so much. We'll be back in just a few minutes.
You could buy me diamonds. You could buy me pearls. Take me on a cruise around the world, baby. You know I'm worth it. And I lit by candles. Run my bubble bath. Make love tenderly. Wanna keep, wanna please, wanna treat your woman right. Not just dull, but I know that you know she's worth your time. You will lose if you choose to refuse to put her first. She will and she can find a man who knows her worth. No, cause a real man knows a real woman when he sees. Welcome back, everyone. You stayed. <laughs> so before we get into this, uh, just a couple things. Anybody here for the first time? Oh, we got a few. Wow, look at this. That's great. Excellent. Yeah, that's it. Tell your friends. There's always something great going on here at the Blue Bamboo, and it's a mom and pop uh, run place with Melody. That's Melody back there. Melody and Chris, they've got a great thing going on here, so your support is very appreciated. Uh, a few upcoming things. We, with the Central Florida Jazz Society, we have a concert series from September through May right here at the Blue Bamboo. It's usually the second Sunday of each month. And today, we actually have the president of the Central Florida Jazz Society. This is Carla Hayes. And of course, we're always looking for new members. Uh, it's a great cause. We raise money for scholarships, and we do a scholarship contest, usually in May, uh, May, May, June. And, and it's open to the public. You, we do it right here. You come and you watch these uh, young musicians play, and it's really pretty special because they're playing so well, and we feel good about helping them pay for their college. Uh, we, I think we have some schol former scholarship winners on the bandstand. That's right, Mr. Ben Kramer. Who else? Co Corey? No, but I think I got a good cousin here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Anyway, our next concert, this is exciting. Our opening concert is September 10th, and uh, through a sponsor, we were able to get Michael Andrew. Anybody know Michael Andrew? Yeah, he's great. So he'll be singing here with the Orlando Jazz Orchestra, so full big band on that concert. And then a, another special show, September 17th, we'll have the Orlando Jazz Orchestra here doing the music of Neil Hefty. Anybody know that name? Oh, yeah. Few people know that name, Neil Hefty. Neil Hefty had a great career. Uh, he started out playing trumpet with the big bands, uh, like Woody Herman. Then he started writing, and he wrote the music for the Atomic Basie, if you're familiar with that album. That's considered one of the greatest big band recordings ever. So we'll do the music from that album. But most people know him as writing the theme song from The Odd Couple, the Batman, that theme song. So we'll have a little bit of fun with that show. That's September 17th. Okay, enough of that. We'd like to uh, continue on here with uh, Maddie's third album, Four Button Dixie. It's, it's a traditional jazz album recorded by Maddie Matlock and his band, The Paducah Patrol, in 1958 on the Warner Brothers record label. The album features a lineup of talented musicians, including Eddie Miller on Barry Sax, Johnny Best and Shorty Chirac on trumpets, 
Mo Schneider and Abe Lincoln on trombones, not the Abe you're thinking of. <laughs> George Van Epps on guitar, Stan Reitzman on piano, Morty Korb on bass, and Nick Fatul on drums. Many of those musicians actually, I believe they met each other with the uh, Bob Crosby Orchestra. So they're all coming from that same uh, uh, kind of uh, concept of playing uh, Dixieland, but also during the swing era. That's why you hear that uh, Dixie and swing influence with this music. Uh, together they had what Maddie called a unity of approach. They were making no attempt at imitating the sounds of the 1920s, but they were keeping the basic drive and beat. Some of the songs came from the jazz bands themselves, while others were from Tin Pan Alley. Here's a short bit from the original liner notes. True, other kinds of jazz have come on the scene, swing, bop, cool, progressive, Afro-Cuban, you name it, and each has acquired its own top musicians and devoted fans. But there are great instrumentalists who have always been devoted to traditional jazz, among them Maddie Matlock, and vast numbers, judging from the sales of Maddie's last two re albums, of listening and or dancing Dixieland enthusiasts. So we're going to uh, start the second set with the opening track from that album, In a Shanty in an Old Shanty Town. Anybody familiar with that song? It's a popular song with music by Ira Schuster and Jack Little with lyrics by Joe Young. The song was published in 1932 and quickly became a hit during the early 30s. Uh, the song's lyrics tell the story of a shanty town, a poor and rundown neighborhood where the singer reminisces about a lost love and happier times. Despite the difficult living conditions, the singer finds solace and comfort in the memories of their past relationship. The song's sentimental and nostalgic lyrics, paired with its catchy melody, melody struck <laughs> I know, I'm struggling today. <laughs> That's good. We, we can all laugh about it. <laughs> it struck a chord with audiences during the Great Depression, as it conveyed themes of resilience and finding hope in the midst of hardship. Uh, it's been recorded by many, many artists. Uh, Ted Lewis and his band performed it in the film The Crooner in 1932. His version was released as a single and it went to number one, where it remained for 10 weeks. Since then, numerous artists, uh, other artists have recorded it, including Louis Armstrong, Johnny Mercer, Dinah Washington, and many others. So here's Shanty in an Old Shanty Town.
Jeremy Frotti on the clarinet. Phil Lorenz on the Barry sax. Alex Kastner on the trumpet. Sweet Georgia Brown. Oh, you know that one. <laughs> Composed by Ben Burney and Maceo Pinkard with lyrics by Kenneth Casey. The song was first published in 1925 and has since become one of the world's most recognizable tunes. Reportedly, Ben Burney came up with a concept for the song's lyrics, although he is not the credited lyricist, after meeting Dr. George Thaddeus Brown in New York City. Dr. Brown, a longtime member of the Georgia House of Representatives, told Bernie about his daughter, Georgia Brown. Uh, Georgia Brown and, not, and how, so, so <laughs> forgive me. <laughs> I feel like a first grader here. Uh, and how subsequent her birth in, on August 11th, 1911, the Georgia General Assembly had issued a declaration that she was to be named Georgia after the state. This anecdote would be directly referenced by the song's lyric, Georgia claimed her, Georgia named her. The tune was first recorded in, on March 19, 1925 by band leader Bernie, resulting in five weeks at number one for Ber Ben Bernie and his Hotel Roosevelt Orchestra. However, it was the Harlem Globetrotters basketball team that significantly boosted the song's popularity in the 20th century. In the 1940s, the Globetrotters ad 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 adopted <laughs> Sweet Georgia Brown as their theme song, using it during their on-court routines and warm-ups. This association with the basketball team solidified the song's place in popular culture and made it synonymous with sports and the entertainment events. Uh, so we'd like to play for you next, Sweet Georgia Brown.
That's Jeremy Fratti on the clarinet. Corey Paul on the trombone. Mama's gone, goodbye. Anybody know that tune? <laughs> it's a traditional jazz song that has become a classic in the New Orleans jazz and Dixieland repertoire. The music was composed by A.J. Perone, a well-known orchestra leader and New Orleans uh, uh, lyricist. Uh, he put this together with Peter Bocage, who played in Perone's orchestra, and Walter Melrose, a music publisher and lyricist. Uh, the lyrics of Mama's Gone Goodbye depict a woman who is leaving her man to find another who will treat her right. Anybody familiar with that? <laughs> Over the years, the song has been recorded and performed by numerous jazz artists and bands, including Anne Margaret with Al Hurt, Peggy Lee, and Bobby Hackett, and many others. So we'd like to play for you now, Mama's Gone Goodbye. Thank you. 
Jeremy Fratti on the clarinet. Sean Villanueva on the trumpet. And how about it for Jake Jones on the guitar? Nobody's Sweetheart is a popular jazz and swing song with uh, music by Billy Myers and Elmer Schobel, who was the piano player in the New Orleans Rhythm Kings at the time. And lyrics written by Gus Kahn and Ernie Erdman. The song was first published in 1924 and quickly became a hit. The lyrics of Nobody's Sweetheart revolved around themes of unrequited love and heartbreak. This is like the same thing over and over, right? <laughs> The singer expresses their feelings of being left behind by someone they deeply cared for, hence becoming nobody's sweetheart. Aw, sad, right? <laughs> the song was introduced by Ted Lewis in the Broadway review The Passing Show of 1923, and it was first recorded in 1924 by Isham Jones. Anybody remember the name Isham Jones? Okay, he had a band, but more importantly, when he had enough of being a band leader, he simply passed it over to Woody Herman, and it became the Woody Herman Orchestra. Uh, where did I leave off here? <laughs> it's been re recorded by uh, people like Red Nichols, Paul Whiteman, Cab Calloway, and of course the Mills Brothers. Uh, so we'd like to play this for you now, Nobody's Sweetheart.
Jeremy Frothy on the clarinet. Sean Villanueva on the tr trumpet. And of course, Derek Harris on the trombone. Everybody Loves My Baby. Anybody remember that one? A popular jazz song with music composed by Spencer Williams and lyrics written by Jack Palmer. The song was published in 1924. The lyrics of Everybody Loves My Baby convey a joyful and boastful tone with the singer proudly stating that everyone loves their baby, making them feel like the luckiest person in the world. The song's catchy and upbeat melody, coupled with its playful and charming lyrics, contributed to its widespread popularity during the jazz age. It quickly became a jazz standard, and many bands and artists from that era recorded it. One of the early notable recordings of Everybody Loves My Baby was by Clarence Williams, his Blue Five in 1925, featuring Louis Armstrong on vocals and cornet. Armstrong's lively and charismatic performance on the recording helped popularize, popularize the song and solidify its place in the jazz repertoire. Over the years, it's been recorded by the who's who of the music industry, like Glenn Miller, Bing Crosby, Dinah Washington, the Mills Brothers, and Doris Day sang it in the 1955 film, Love Me or Leave Me. So we'd like to play for you now, Everybody Loves My Baby. Jeremy Frotti on the clarinet, Sean Villanueva on the trumpet, Corey Paul on the trombone. When Buddha Smiles stands as a jazz masterpiece from 1921, crafted by Nacio Herb Brown with the lyrics by Arthur Freed. Nacio Herb Brown was a very successful songwriter, and Arthur Freed was a lyricist and Hollywood film producer. Together they wrote some classic songs like All I Do Is Dream Of You, Make Him Laugh, and Sing It In The Rain. When Buddha Smiles mirrors the exuberant and carefree ethos of the Roaring Twenties, the song's title and lyrics con conjure a feeling of serenity and elation, encapsulating, these are big words, <laughs> the tranquil smile associated with Buddha. The song saw successful recordings by Rudy Whitehoff's Californians. Anybody remember that group? We, okay, 
Terry Myers knows about, all about Rudy. Paul Whiteman and Louis Armstrong. However, it was Benny Goodman who truly catapulted the tune to popularity in 1935. So Maddie's arrangement of this is really kind of neat because to me it sounds like something you would write if you had Tommy Dorsey and Benny Goodman in the same band. So the first part of this tune kind of sounds like uh, Tommy Dorsey maybe playing Song of India. It's kind of uh, nice melodic trombone playing, beautiful trombone playing by our trombone players. Uh, and then we kick into uh, what you might hear Benny Goodman and Gene Krupa play in the middle of this. So this is When Buddha Smiles.
That's Jeremy Frothy on the clarinet. Alex Kastner on the trumpet. Oh, myself, thank you. <laughs> I gotta catch my breath. So you see what I mean about that arrangement, right? It sounds like something Tommy Dorsey would play. Pretty interesting. Blue and Broken Hearted. Anybody remember that one? Okay, a couple people. Cherished jazz composition attributed to the collaborative efforts of Lou Hardman, Grant Clark, and Edgar Leslie. The song saw its debut in 1922 and quickly became a hit. The lyrics of Blue and Broken Hearted served as a poignant portrayal of sorrow and heartache following the end of an intimate relationship. The singer bemoans their somber and shattered emotional state, painting a vivid picture of the anguish stemming from lost love. A lot of sad stuff today, right? <laughs> the song was first recorded by Yerkes' SS Flotilla or Flotilla Orchestra from 1922. Terry, you remember that one? <laughs> <laughs> Many other artists have recorded it, but it is most likely ingrained in memory through the recordings of Jimmy Dorsey with vocalist Bob Everly and Helen O'Connell. And of course, Bing Crosby had a big hit on this. This is called Blue and Broken Hearted.
Once again, Jeremy Fratti on the clarinet. Alex Kastner on the trumpet. And how about it for Jake Jones on the guitar? We've got one more for you here today. But before we leave you, uh, our next concert here with this group will be November 5th. And this time, uh, we're focusing on the music from the swing era. So there's a lot of music in this library. We'll focus on that. And that one will be actually the, the size of the group that Bill typically would go out with. And that would be the five horns and a three-man rhythm section. Uh, we'll miss Jake, but we'll see him again soon. Uh, so we hope you to see you there for that November 5th. And uh, once again, we want to thank, uh, you know, Bill Allred for collecting all this music and passing it along. Thank you so much, Bill. <laughs> and also Terry Myers, who uh, filled in at a couple of our rehearsals and has been just a, a great uh, cheerleader for this group. So let's, let's hear it for Terry Myers. So we're going to close out the show with a tune called Alabama Bound. It, wait, you know this. How about that? It's a Tin Pan Alley tune written in 1924 with music by Ray Henderson and words by Buddy De Silva and Bud Green. This was the first collaboration between lyricist Buddy De Silva and composer Ray Henderson, a partnership that would last until 1930 with lyricist Lou Brown instead of Bud Green. De Silva gave the song to singer Al Jolson, who liked it and began performing it on every occasion, including special appearances, nightclubs, and restaurants. The song became associated with him and a hit before it was even recorded. Sheet music sales exceeded one million. Given the popularity of the song, it was interpolated into the Broadway show Kid Boots, featuring Eddie Cantor, which reportedly prevented the show from closing for some time. The earliest recording of the song was made in 1929, or sorry, 1924 by the Paul Whiteman Orchestra, which was uh, then released in 1925. That year, Blossom Seeley had a number two hit with her recording, and Isham Jones made a popular rendition as well. In 1941, the song was revived when it was included in the Great American Broadcast, sung by the Ink Spots. In 1954, the song re-entered the charts with a rendition by the harmonica duo, the Mulcays. But you remember that group? Okay, look it up, kids. <laughs> More recently, the song was sung by actor Jeff Daniels in the 1985 movie, The Purple Rose of Cairo. So we're going to leave you with Alabama Bound.
Jeremy Frotti on the clarinet. Phil Lorenz on the berry. Bob Thornton on the piano. Derek Harris on the trombone. The whole band, stand up, fellas. Thank you so much for joining us today. Please come back and see us again. Have a great afternoon. Dream.